How many of you know that he's still God? Yeah, he's still God. He's still on the throne, ain't he? Yeah, you came in here with something, but he's still God. Yeah, you came in here struggling for money, but he's still God. You came in here wondering where your faith goes from here, but he's still God. You came in here like, I don't even, I ain't even want to come to this church today because I don't even believe in God, but he's still God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, listen, how many of y'all were blessed last week by Tisha's sermon? Can we give her some love for that word she preached? Let me tell y'all something. See, y'all don't appreciate this because y'all get it every week, but the preaching anointing on this house is different. It's different. It ain't better, but it's different. You miss me. I said it's different. See, there's preaching and then there's proclamation. There's a lot of churches that preach. There's a few churches that proclaim. And preaching and proclamation is not, the difference isn't, like, like, like when you have proclamation, this isn't thus suggest the Lord. This is thus says the Lord. There's a lot of churches you walk into and it's like a suggestion. Like God is like suggestion, suggesting you should change, suggesting you should think. No, 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 no. Here is God is saying, girl, get it together. Hey, yo, fam. Yo, 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 yo. Get it, get, get it right. So listen, we got a lot of ground to cover. I, I, we got baptism Sunday. Y'all hype? So, so I want to get straight into the word. I want to get straight into the word and let's hear what God has to say to us. Um, we're in, Joseph, we're in uh, Genesis 41. Um, it reads, verse 8, it reads, In the morning, his mind was troubled, so he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them for him. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, Today I am reminded of my shortcomings. Pharaoh was once angry with his servants, and he imprisoned me in the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream that same night. And each dream had a meaning of its own. Now a Hebrew youngin was there, and he was a servant of the captain of the guard. And we told him our dreams and all that, and he interpreted them for us, and then gave us interpretation of, of each dream. And things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position, and the other man was impaled. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought up from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes and put on some cologne, he came before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it. But I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can't interpret it. I can't do it, Joseph replied, but God will give Pharaoh the answer. You know that's going to preach right there. Um, I, I, then Pharaoh said to Joseph, in my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile when out of the water came seven cows, fat and sleek. And they grazed among the reeds. And then after them, seven other cows came up, scrawny and skinny and ugly and lean. And, I have, and I've never seen such ugly cows in all the land of Egypt. The lean and ugly cows ate up the seven fat cows. That came, up, that came first. But then after that, they ate them. But even after they ate them, no one could tell that they had done so. So they looked just as ugly as before. And then I woke up. Yeah, that's, the, that's not a good dream right there. And then in my other dream, I saw seven heads of grain, full and good, growing on a, on a single stalk. And then after them, seven other heads sprouted, withered, and then scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven good heads. I told this to the magicians, but none of them could explain it to me. So then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do. I love when God does that. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads of grain are seven years. It is one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that came up after are seven years, and, 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 and so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. Wait, favor and famine go together? It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God. In other words, God is about to do this. 
and so and now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man to put him in charge over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming, bless you, and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come up from Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and all his officials. So Pharaoh said, where can we find someone like this man where the spirit of God is on him? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you. Oh, well, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. Why don't you just do it? So, so you shall be in charge of my palace and all the people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. That preached by itself. Let me pray, let me pray for y'all. Father God, we need a word from you today, God. We need you to meet us today, God. Some of us are in a famine. Some of us are in a dungeon. Some of us are in a pit. But God, help us see today how favor and famine go hand in hand. God, I believe that you're going to give us a word that's going to change our lives and change the trajectory of how we approach difficult seasons. Lord, I'm praying that it's also going to change the way that we handle and live in good seasons. And so, God, regardless of what it is that is said today, I pray that you get the glory in it all. I pray for permission to preach. May you get this dust of a man out the way so that your people can see you. And I pray that the words of my lips and meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, God, our strength and our redeemer. Everybody who agree with that said, you guys may be seated. You may be seated. So have y'all enjoyed this journey through the life of Joseph? Have y'all enjoyed this? Have y'all enjoyed Joseph? Yeah, yeah, let me know. See, the reason why we've spent the last month talking about Joseph is because Joseph gives us a contradiction. In Joseph, we meet the collaborative coexistence of two contradicting realities. Yeah, I know, I just had to wake somebody up. I just went straight PhD on you. In Joseph, we meet the collaborative coexistence of two contradicting realities, favor and famine. Favor and famine go hand in hand. Joseph wore the coogee of many colors, favor. But then his brothers throw him in a pit, famine. Joseph rose through the ranks and began managing all of Potiphar's house, everything, favor. But then Potiphar's wife caught feelings, tried to shoot her shot, got denied, no, no, no. Then lied on him, and he got thrown in prison. Famine. And now in today's text, Joseph becomes the prince of Egypt, second in command in the most powerful nation in the world. Favor. But it starts with him as a prisoner of the captain of the guard. Famine. Do you know that favor and famine always go together when you have favor you'll always experience seasons of famine you'll never have a season of favor without a season of famine because favor shows up in your life in strong in strange ways has anybody had some favor in the house that can attest to that truth sometimes it shows up through victories other times it shows up through defeats Sometimes it shows up through friendships. Other times it shows up through hardships. When you got a little bit of favor on your life, you're always going to have a whole lot of famine that comes with it. But when you have favor, here's what you need to know. No, there's, no matter what people throw you in, no matter what pit they throw you in, what prison they throw you in, what place they put you in, what they said about you, talked about you, tweeted about you, walked out of your life saying, you will always rise to the top. See, I just needed somebody with a little bit of favor to help me right there. If you've been through something, just a little bit of something, and you know they threw you in something and thought they left you to death, they put the dirt on you, they thought you was gone, and little did they know they didn't bury you, they planted you. My God, my God, when favor and famine come together, it looks like death, but it's really producing life. I feel like preaching right here in the introduction because I had a week off. The devil wants you to think that your famine means that you don't have favor. He wants you to think that you don't have favor because you don't have finances. 
He wants you to think you don't have favor because you don't got friends. He wants you to think you don't got favor because your family is real shaky. But I came to let somebody know that those challenges in your life that produce famine are also a favor. Without the famine, you wouldn't know who you are. See, you don't know who you are right now because you've been running from the famine. Because you just want to get out the famine. But without going through something, you won't know who you are. Without the famine, you won't know what you solve. And here's what I want to tell you. Sometimes God will fix your situation just so that it needs your services. It was Joseph's famine that made his services necessary. It's because they, oh, my God. Point one, I got a lot to say, so I just can't even stay. In the famine, you're not forgotten. I said in the famine, you're not forgotten. You think you're forgotten right now because you're in a pit. In the famine, you're not forgotten. In today's passage, Pharaoh has two dreams, two dreams, two dreams. And these aren't good dreams. You know, these aren't the kind of dreams where, like, you got promoted or, like, you, you could fly. You know those dreams where, like, you're a superhero? Like, you know those dreams, like, you Captain Marvel or something, right? No, no, it, it, it ain't that kind of dream, boo-boo. Um, um, these are the kind of dreams that make you, that you wake up from mad at your spouse. You know what I'm talking about? The mad at your, see, y'all ain't never, y'all ain't married. That's why y'all don't know. These are the mad at your spouse kind of dreams. You wake up and you mad at them, right? Like, cause you, you dream they did, they cheated or they did something. That, and you mad and they like, what, yo, what did I do? Yo, I, I cooked dinner for you last night. Why are you mad? Like, this is the mad at your spouse kind of dream. And so after Pharaoh has this dream, the Bible says in the morning his mind was troubled because it's always trouble. You wake up in your feelings whenever you have these kinds of dreams. So he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them for him. Pharaoh does a Google search throughout his kingdom. And he's looking for solutions to his problem. I've had this dream. I don't understand what it means. Can somebody help me? So he does a Google search, and, and all the magicians and wise men of Egypt show up in his search results. And so he brings them in. But no matter what spells they conjure up or what authorities they call on or what titles they came with, none of them could give Pharaoh an interpretation. Sometimes solutions don't come from qualified places. If you're going to be a solution today, you have to realize that solutions don't always come from qualified places. Sometimes solutions come from people you think less of. Sometimes solutions come from people you overlook, and that's your problem. See, that nerd you made fun of in class is about to go run the next tech company in, th- in 10 years. And because you didn't, mm. see, sometimes favor comes in packages that we don't like, that don't look attractive to us, that don't come in the ways that the world says is powerful or great. But see, sometimes solutions don't come from trained professionals. Sometimes they come from prisoners. Because that's what Joseph is. He ain't a trained professional. He's a prisoner. Are there any unqualified solutions in God's house today? If you are an unqualified solution, can you just make some noise one time? If you are someplace that you have no business being right now, just let me know that God's been good to you. If you just un- if your resume doesn't say you should be there, and your job experience don't say you should be there, and your background and education don't say you should be there, but you're here anyway. If you're an unqualified solution, I just want to hear you give God some praise. So after Pharaoh can't find help for his problem on Google, the Bible says, then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, you know, today I'm reminded of my shortcomings. Because one time Pharaoh was angry at your boy and he imprisoned me. And then the chief baker and I were in prison and each of us had a dream that same night and each dream had a meaning of its own. But there was a young Hebrew there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard, and we told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream. And things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position, and the other man was impaled. So after all the experts fail, Pharaoh's cupbearer says, you know, Pharaoh, I met this Hebrew young and while I was doing my bid. You know, I was up north for you. For that thing thing, you remember that thing? It got, it got a little sticky and I got into something, you know. And so I was up north and, and I remember I had this dream, right? And when I had this dream while I was locked up, 
I didn't understand what it meant. And me and this baker had this dream while we was doing our bed. And then all of a sudden, this Hebrew came along and was like, oh, I can help you with that dream. Here's what God is saying to you. God is saying in three days, you're about to come up. But then in three days to the baker, you're about to be executed. Now, notice, though, he said before that, today I'm reminded of my shortcomings. He says this because after Joseph interpreted his dream, Joseph told him, when all goes well with you, Remember your boy. Show me some kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh when you get out this prison. Because I was forcibly carried. Let's see, Joseph start telling his life story. Y'all ever been through something? And you ask someone for help, but that ain't good enough? You got to start telling all the reasons why. Yeah, because I thought he was faithful and he cheated. And so, and yeah, yo, when I got here, yo, she said she was looking. Like, you start telling everything, right? He says, I was forcibly carried off. The, he didn't ask all that. I was forcibly carried from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. After Joseph gave him revelation into a situation that lacked information, oh, oh. <laughs> y'all could get my mixtape later, I'm just telling you. <laughs> All he asked him for was to put a plug in to Pharaoh once he got promoted. Put in a good word for the boy. Just look out for the kid one time. And when things happen just as Joseph predicted, the Bible says, now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for all his officials. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials. But he restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that once again he put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he impaled the chief baker, just as Joseph has said to them in the interpretation. But look at what happens. But the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Joseph did him a solid, and he did Joseph dirty. Joseph asked for a favor, and the cupbearer forgot him. Sometimes in life, people will use your gifts and then throw you away once they get what they want. But what I need you to understand is this. In the famine, people will fail you, but God won't forget you. <clears throat> the cupbearer forgot Joseph, but God remembered him. And two years later now, Pharaoh has a problem, but the cupbearer knows a solution. <clears throat> in those seasons where we feel like we're in a prison, the famine is frustrating, isn't it? The famine will have you tight. The brutality of rejection and the consistency of challenges beats you down one disappointment after another. But what Joseph didn't understand was that God was orchestrating something in the shadows that was going to make Joseph a solution. God was doing something in the dark that was going to call Joseph out in the light. Oh, my God, some of you are praying to get out of the very place that's preparing you for your purpose. Did you hear what I just said? What you want to get through, what you just want to get over, what you just want to pass is the very thing that's making you necessary. Do you understand that? Joseph becomes necessary because they forgot him. The pit, the prison being forgotten by the cupbearer, all prepared Joseph for the moment that he was going to be summoned by the king. If the cupbearer would have remembered Joseph two years earlier, Joseph would not be running Egypt now. If they didn't forget you then, God wouldn't be able to promote you now. What you don't understand is the very thing you're asking God to get rid of in your life, your relationship problems your marriage struggles, your career decisions, where life is, where your mental health state is. All of those things are shaping you into a solution. They're making you necessary. They're making you who you were made to be, not just who you are. See, most of you are who you've had to be, not who you were made to be. So you say things like, yeah, I don't like nobody because, yeah, you know, I mean, people did me wrong, no boo-boo. No, 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 but oh, oh, well, I'm an introvert. That's why I isolate. No, no, no. Mm -mm. No, no, no. What, what, no, but you know, I've been through a lot. That's why I overdrink. No, that's not what's going on. You've learned to function 
with who you've had to be, not with who God made you to be. I got to move. Joseph becomes necessary because Pharaoh has a need. So when all of the people with titles and credentials fail, one of Pharaoh's employees say, I met this guy with no title, no status, no credentials. In fact, he's not even a right ethnicity. His skin ain't the right color. He a Hebrew. But I had a solution, I had a situation like this, and he helped me solve it. Joseph was the wrong skin color, went to the wrong school, had a criminal record. So, <laughs> he, I ain't got no unqualified solutions in here. I ain't got nobody who just should not be where they are in this place today. Joseph got a criminal record, and yet he's about to be summoned to solve the king of Egypt's problem. Everything that you think is wrong with you is what makes you right for God to use you. When God looks at you, he doesn't see what you're not. He sees what you are. What if what you are speaks louder than what you're not? Your problem is you let what you're not speak louder than what you are. But what you have to learn is this. You have to learn how to be disappointed and keep moving. I'm sorry, we all been there, baby. We've been through stuff. You're not the only one. But you got disappointed and got stuck. You have to learn how to be disappointed and keep moving. You have to learn how to be let down by people and love again. Because God is going to take everything that you lost, everything that you lost to set you up for what you're about to gain. And look at what happens next. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. And when he had shaved, because you know he had to clean up, and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Wait. <clears throat> look at how quickly Joseph's situation changes. One word from the king, and Joseph went from the dungeon to the throne room. How many of you know that all it takes is one word from the king. <laughs> all it takes is one word from the king. All it takes is one word from the king and all them rags turn to riches. All it takes is one word from the king and all that trash turns to treasure. All it takes is one word from the king and that mess becomes a ministry. That trial becomes triumph. That depression becomes deliverance. One word from the king. But here's the thing, here's the thing, here's the thing. Here's the thing, don't clap too loud because when the king calls, your demeanor must change. You missed that. I said when the king calls, your demeanor must change. When Joseph hears from the king, he shaves. And he takes a shower and he changes his clothes and he beats that face because his situation is shifting. He discerns that his situation is shifting. Your biggest problem is you take old perspectives into new seasons. That's your biggest problem. You take what they did to you into the season where God's about to do something for you. And so you take all these old perspectives into all these new seasons, and you don't discern that your situation is shifting. Somebody say shift. Somebody say it's shifting. See, we must be discerning enough to understand when the Spirit of God is moving us from one season to the next. I sense in my spirit today that God wants to move somebody in here from one season to the next. I sense in my spirit today that God wants to move somebody from the pit to promotion. But you can't go where God is calling you without washing your face and doing your makeup and changing your wardrobe and stop walking around looking sad at people, wanting people to feel sorry for you. Oh my God, look, I'm just going through all this stuff. Oh, girl, let me just come cry you. No, 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 no. Don't just go through it. Grow through it. What you need to understand 
Is God intended for you to learn lessons in the dungeon, not live there? The dungeon is not a destination. You can't live there, but you have. You've pitched a tent in the dungeon. You, you, you've only thought about what's not good or right in your life. You, you, you weren't made to live in a dungeon. You, that was a, that, that's not a destination. That's a, that, that's a path towards your de de destiny. Oh, my God. So, so, so don't justify bad decisions you make because you took old perspectives into a new season. No, you've turned your dungeon into a destination. That's what you've done. And that ain't nobody's fault but yours. You can't control people's actions, but you can control your reaction. I, l I listened to a brain uh, neurosurgeon uh, scientist say this the other day. Neuroscientist said, you can, never, you can never stop what somebody else is going to do. You can't stop what somebody else's action is. She said, but, the brain, but brain studies show we are 1,000% in control of all of our reactions. 1,000% in control. So you haven't controlled the things you can control. That's your problem. You let the things that you can't control control you. Man, I got to move, man. We got to get baptized today. What you've been through has attached itself to you, and it's molding you rather than maturing you. Some of you walk into the presence of the king so heavy and attached to things that are ugly and broken that you didn't just shave off and wash off, even if you don't feel better. You make a decision to live better. Do you understand what I'm telling you? You think because Joseph shaved, he forgot all the years in prison? You think because he put on new clothes, he forgot all the people that stripped him, off, that stripped him of his coat? No! But just because he didn't feel like doing it doesn't mean he didn't do it. My God. See, if you're going to have favor in the famine, you need to go, go, grow through things, not just go through things. There's some people, every time you talk to them, they're just going through it. How many of you got this people in your life? Whoever ain't got their hand up might be that person. <laughs> There's some people, every time you see them, well, Pastor K, I'm just going through it, Pastor K, I'm just going through it. Well, Pastor K, I'm just going through this thing, Pastor K, I'm just going through this thing. This thing ain't changed yet. This thing, I'm going through it, I'm going through it. And I have to stop them and say, okay, boo-boo, okay, okay, I get it, I get it, fam. Okay, here's, I see what you're going through, but what are you growing through? <laughs> you missed that. Okay, I see what you're going through, but what are you growing through? If you're going to go through it, then grow through it. But if you're going through it but not growing through it, then you're taking losses without learning lessons. That's the definition of insanity. To do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. You should not be going through the same thing in 2019 that you was going through in 2018, 2017, 2016, 2015. Listen, there are some persistent things. I get it. There's some mental health stuff that's persistent. There's some relational stuff that's persistent. There's some trauma that's persistent. But my God, are you just still going through it in 2019? When are you going to get tired? When are you going to say it's enough? I'm taking control of my life. I'm taking control of my future. I'm going to shave my hair. I'm going to get my cut. I'm going to put some perfume on. I'm going to beat my face. And I'm going to walk out into this world on water. There's no guarantee the storm will stop. There's no guarantee I'm going to stop feeling what I feel. But I'm going to make a decision. High five your neighbor and say, make a decision. Has anybody made a decision and seen things change in their life? Has somebody, put your hand up if you made a decision and seen things change. Well, look around you. Whoever's hand is up, if yours isn't, that means God is in the neighborhood. If God did it for your neighbor, then it means he's in the neighborhood. Don't play with me today. Don't play with me today. Some of y'all came here to play church. Don't play with me today. Your dungeon is not a destination or a definition. It is not a destination or a definition. Stop letting the dungeon define you. It is for discipline and development. That's what it is. God is discipling you through your dungeon. But you must train your discernment so that when he moves, you move. Just like that. When he shifts, you shift. Just like that. When he lets the chains loose, don't put them back on. Just like that. 
because your season is shifting. I got to move. Second point. This is, this is my last point. Second point. In the famine, your favor will bring you freedom. So after Job cleans up and changes his clothes because the situation is shifting, the Bible says, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one could interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph has a reputation. Pharaoh says, Joe, I had this crazy dream and nobody can tell me what any of it means. But I heard through the wire that you're the man I need to see. The streets was talking. But notice Joseph isn't called to the palace because he has a dream. Ooh, wee. Ooh, that one went way over your head. Some of you going to get that in mo- on Monday. <laughs> Notice that Joseph isn't called to the palace because he has a dream. He's called to the palace because he interprets other people's dreams. Oh, my God. There's a principle in there. God isn't calling you there because you can see. He's calling you there because you can help other people see. I ain't getting no help. The last thing that's keeping God from using you the way he wants to use you, it's not the dungeon, it's not the defeats, it's not the difficulty, it's you. It's you. You're the variable that goes into every season. The faces change, but you remain the same. It's not them, it's you. That's the only thing stopping God from using you. The way he wants to use you. Joseph didn't understand. Think about Joseph. <coughs> in chapter 37, when we began this, Joseph di- had this dream, didn't understand it, right? Y'all remember that? Told everybody about it because he didn't understand the dream. Y'all had two dreams, man. I don't I had one, hand, you know, I was standing up and everybody bowed down. What did I, I don't know. No, 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 no. Uh. But by chapter 41, after he's gone through it, after he went through it and then grew through it, By chapter 41 now, four chapters later, he's not known for his dream anymore. He's known for helping other people find theirs. The man that couldn't interpret his own dream (coughs) is known for helping other people interpret theirs. My God, if you have a dream today, I need you to stop texting just to write this down. If you have a dream, if only if you got a dream. If you got a dream, keep texting. But if you got a dream, stop texting. Here's what I need you to see. God got Joseph to his dreams because Joseph helped other people get to theirs. If you would help other people get to their dreams, God will use them. I said God will use them to get you to yours. See, the reason why that's hard for us to amen is because we live in a, si- in a city where everybody just wants to chase their dreams. Oh, Lord, I got a little bit of look at the Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. There we go. That's the Lord right there. D- that was the Lord descending down like at the baptism just to let us know he in the building. See, 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 here's the thing. We live in a city where everybody wants to be known for chasing their dreams. Everybody wants to be known for their hustle and their grind. The first thing you, you look at when a when person, when, they, when, they, when you meet them, is how many followers they got, how big their business is, how much money they make. Like, we live in a city where everybody just wants to be known for chasing their dreams, but nobody wants to help somebody else chase theirs. In this city, everybody wants to make it big, but nobody wants to help someone else make it big. But what you, what I want you to know is this is how you really stand out. The way you really make a difference and look different and the way you really look like Jesus is by doing nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, somebody say humility. But in humility, consider others as more important than yourself. When you start putting other people's dreams Before your own, something strange starts to happen. You start to look like Jesus. And I don't know if anybody in here wants to look like Jesus, but I sure do. I don't want to look like nobody famous you know. I don't want to look like no famous preacher. I appreciate the compliments. Pastor K, you sound like this person, you sound like that person. If you you ain't telling me I don't sound like Jesus, there's a problem. 
I, I, I want to sound like Jesus. I want to look like Jesus. I want to smell like Jesus. I want people to touch me and think that they had an encounter with Jesus. I want to be so filled with God's spirit that when people people say, I never met his God, but I know he's real. Like, like, like I, I don't know about y'all, but, but that's my prayer every single day. But, but you don't get there until you start putting other people's dreams in front of your own. And when you start to look like Jesus, what you'll find is your biggest blessing is not in what you achieve, but in what you help other people achieve. The wealthiest businessman in China is named Wang Jalen. He accumulated all of this tremendous wealth. He's a billionaire hundreds of times over, right? He accumulated all this wealth by simply using this principle. In every business deal Wang Jalen has, he, he gives away the majority share to all of his partners. He has the biggest name, he has the most money, he can take the most if he wanted to. But in every business deal that he does, in every company he acquires, in every new business he starts, he gives away the majority of the share to his partners. And when somebody asks Wayne Jalen, why do you do that? Like, you have the most clout. You can just snatch it and take it because it's yours. He said, but that's why everybody wants to do business with me. See, I do twice as much business as the next most famous businessman in China because everybody wants to do business with me. Because I've built a reputation of giving away the most, not of taking the most. Do you understand that you attract more things when you give, not when you take? See, I've just helped everybody in here get five steps closer to their dream. I'm like Drew Hill. <laughs> you just got five steps. If you took that principle right now, your business will change. I'm telling you if, you, if you just took that principle home, you ain't take nothing else I said right now and just took that home, your life would change. Your funeral will look different. I promise you, your funeral will look different. But don't miss this. Even though Joseph has a reputation, listen to his response. Pharaoh says, I heard that you can interpret this dream. Here's what Joseph says. I can't do it. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Joseph says, Pharaoh, I can't, but God can. Ooh, that's the secret sauce to success right there. The thing that gives me an advantage in every environment I go in is not my training or my gifting or anointing. Those are all good things. Everybody got that. What gives me an advantage in every environment that I go in is I live cognizant of the reality that I can't, but God can. I live every day of my life with the conscious awareness that I can't, but God can. Once you realize that I can't, but God can, there's nothing that can stand against you. I might get credit for TGH, but I didn't cause TGH. I can't, but God can. One time somebody said to me, Kenny, why do you give God credit for your hard work? You were the one that as an athlete was putting in work while everybody else was clubbing. You're the one that's working 60 and 70 hour weeks as a pastor while everyone else is chilling and watching Netflix. And, and I told them, I said, you know, I work out of my identity, not for my identity. That's the first problem you got. See, some of y'all in here working for an identity. Not out of one. You got it backwards, boo-boo. That, that job don't give you an identity. Don't get your identity from something that ain't designed you. Don't let something define you that ain't designed you. Oh. Lord, we just, I'm putting that on a shirt, Lord. Don't let something define you that ain't designed you. <laughs> Write that down, gents. I, I'm going to need that one later. <laughs> Plenty of people work 60-hour days a weeks rather, and are miserable. But I work 60 hour weeks and feel joy. It's hard at times. Some weeks I feel like I'm in a dungeon. Other weeks it feels like a delight. But all of it is grace. I've learned that the famine is a favor. They go hand in hand. The favor is grace, but so is the famine. I know where I was where, when God found me. This is what I tell people. You know why I give God the glory? Because I know what pit he pulled me out of. 
I know what place he grabbed me from. So now that I have a platform, I'm not going to forget the one who gave it to me. So I need to live every single day with a conscious awareness that I can't, but God can. Joseph won't take credit for something he didn't give himself. You are, vic- you are a victim of divine plagiarism. If life, was a, if life was a final exam, we all would fail. Because all we do is steal from God and don't give him the credit. <laughs> we just steal God's, we steal God's uh, 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 gifts. We steal God's athleticism. We steal God's looks. We steal God's money. And don't give God credit. We just do it all the time. And, 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 and we're just a group of, we're just full of plagiarism. But, but Joseph says, no, 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 there's another way to live. Don't take credit for something you ain't give yourself. So, so Pharaoh says, all right, look, I, I hear what you're saying. Okay, you can't, but God can. Well, let's see if God can help me. Because um, in my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile when out of the river came seven cows, fat and sleek. And they had all this ugliness on them. And then, one, and then they ate. The, and, then, and then these other seven cows that were ugly, rather, came out, and, and, and the seven cows that were pretty got eaten by the seven cows that was ugly. The tenderoni cows got eaten by the other, anyway. Then I had this dream about grains, and there were seven nice grains that, that we could eat and enjoy, and then seven ugly grains, and they, and they got scorched. And so he says, like, I, I don't understand this. Um, can you help me? And Joseph responds, well, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads of grain are seven years. It's one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that came up afterward are seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain. They are seven years of famine. And then Joseph goes on to say this, and I love this. He says, this famine will be so severe that even the memory of the good years will be erased. As for having two similar dreams, it means that these events have been decreed by God, and he will make it happen. Joseph says, Pharaoh, God is giving you a revelation into what he's about to do. Egypt is about to go through seven years of flourishing. And then after that, Egypt is going to experience seven years of famine. And God said it twice, just so you know he about that life. And when the famine hits the people will forget that the favor ever happened because people are fickle like that. The moment we go through something, we forget that God's favor was ever on us. God's famine, the famine tends to speak louder than God's faithfulness. But the favor and the famine go hand in hand. I said, the favor and the famine go hand in hand. That's why I love what Joseph does next. Despite everything he's been through, he goes above and beyond. He's been through a famine, but Joseph doesn't stop with just interpreting the dream. That's all Pharaoh asked for. Tell me what the dream means. Joseph says, you know what, Pharaoh? I got you, player. I'm not just going to go. I'm not just going to tell you what the dream means. I'm going to give you two things that anybody that's in a famine, if you can learn how to do this, my God, it will change your situation like that. Pharaoh says, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to give you a suggestion, and then I'm going to give you a strategy. And so the first thing he does is a suggestion. Somebody say suggestion. <laughs> Joseph says, <coughs> and now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man, and let Pharaoh put him in charge over the land of Egypt. Now Joseph says, listen, Pharaoh, what you need to do is put a job position on LinkedIn. Because what's happening is you got this situation that's coming, but you need somebody with wisdom and discernment, I, with wisdom and discernment to create a 14-year budget, to create a 14-year budget to get you through it. Now, Joseph could have said, Pharaoh, let me tell you what's about to happen. <laughs> Egypt is about to have uh, seven years of, fa- of favor. And that's going to be good and, 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 and nice and all that. Y- y'all going to like that. But then y'all going to have seven years of famine where everything is going to dry up and everybody going to die. And it's good for you. <laughs> See, that's half of us right there. That's what you get. <laughs> Throwing innocent people in jail and all that. <laughs> I ain't even do nothing. I tried to get help. I tried to tell people I'm innocent. Y'all don't care about justice here. And it's good for you. I see you at the crossroads, so you won't be lonely. I'm going to miss everybody. I'm going to miss. He could have just been going. See, that's y'all petty. 
petty. God, help your people. But instead, Pharaoh doesn't, I'm saying Joseph doesn't do that. Instead, Joseph says, Pharaoh, first you need to find the right person and hire them. Notice his suggestion was based solely on what was best for Pharaoh. It was not based on what's in Joseph's best interest. It was based on what's in Pharaoh's best interest. He didn't say, Pharaoh, you need to hire me because I'm the right person. He said, Pharaoh, this is what the right person looks like. You can't fake wanting what's best for people. People were smelling on you a mile away. You can't fake like you like, you know, and that's church people, man. We so fake in church. God, we just smile in your face, comment on your Instagram, and then be talking about you behind you, but we just fake in church. Like, 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 that's just everywhere is true, but I, it shouldn't be amongst the people of God. If there's any place, there should be authenticity and realness and true, genuine love and concern for one another. It should be amongst the people of God. But we have this spirit of just fakeness where, where, where we fake what and what's best for people. Right, right, but, 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 but you can't fake that. If you genuinely want what's best for people, they will know it, and then they'll genuinely want what's best for you. Second thing he gives them is a strategy. And I'm going to get ready to close. Somebody say strategy. Joseph says, let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest, a fifth, like Bill Murray. Fifth, yeah. A, fi- a fifth. A fifth. What's wrong with y'all? A fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come up on Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. He gave a suggestion and then he gave a strategy. He says, Pharaoh, here's what you need to do. You need to take a fifth. Fifth law. During the seven years of abundance and store it. Because wise people know that life's full of life is full of ups and downs. Wise people know life is full of peaks and valleys. Why, wise people know life is full of highs and lows. So you need to store something away in the seasons that are up so that you'll have enough in the seasons that are down. So he says, save in the good years rather than spend it because you got it. Oops, stepped on some toes. He says, save it in the good years rather than just spending it because you got it. And he says, if you're faithful with the favor, you'll survive the famine. Man, if somebody needs to write that down and put that on their wall. If I'm faithful with this favor, then I'll be, I'll survive any famine. Some of you are struggling in a famine right now because you weren't faithful with the favor. When times were up, you didn't store nothing away for when times go down I gotta move but Joseph avoids a pet peeve of mine Joseph doesn't just show Pharaoh a problem he doesn't just show Pharaoh I was telling our leaders this the other day he doesn't just show I hate when people just say Pastor Gay this is a problem fix it wait what if God shows you the problem it's probably because he wants you to be part of the solution so Joseph says here's a problem Now, let me tell you how I think you can solve it. And the passage concludes with Joseph saying, Joseph's, I mean, with with the Bible saying, Joseph's suggestions were well received by Pharaoh and his officials. So Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this man so filled with the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has revealed to you the meaning of the dreams, of my dreams, clearly no one else is as is as, as intelligent and wise as you. So you will be put in charge of my court. And all my people will take orders from you. Only, referring to I, will, will, will I be greater than you. When you interpret other people's dreams and give them strategy that's in their best interest, something remarkable happens. They begin to see the spirit of God in you. And when people see the spirit of God in you, they want to they promote you. They want to be with you. They want to be around you even if they don't believe in God themselves. Pharaoh doesn't believe in Yahweh. He doesn't believe in Joseph's God, but he sees Joseph's God in him. And as a result, God gives a Jew a position 
in an Egyptian world. Sometimes God gives you positions in a place you don't deserve to be. Got no business. Nothing in your resume says you should be there. Nothing in your past says you should be there. But nothing in Jesus' resume says son of God. Nothing in Jesus' resume said savior of the world. His resume said carpenter. His resume said poor. His resume said oppressed. His resume didn't say king of kings and lord of lords. But God said son, prophet, priest, king. God called him something that no one saw him as. And when humanity threw Jesus in the pit because they didn't recognize who Jesus was, three days later he rose from that pit Shook the dust off of him with the keys to the palace. People of God, I need you to know that now the stone that the builders rejected, I said the stone that the builders rejected, I said they might have thrown you in a pit, they might have said forget you, curse your name, and put dirt on you. But the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And the Lord has done this. And it is marvelous to see, just like Jesus and Joseph, everything that you're going through is growing you into what God has graced you to be. So if you're in a season right now as we close that makes no sense, be encouraged. Because you're probably right in the center of God's will. You're probably right where God wants you to be. You're probably right in the place that's about to go from famine to favor. But when the king calls you, you make sure you're ready. When the king summons you, you make sure your skills are sharpened. Because you're going to stand before people that you got no business standing in front of. And when you do, you better be ready. Let me pray for you. Father God, I thank you that the favor and the famine go hand in hand. God, I thank you for this word that you met us with. God, I thank you for Joseph's life because even though we only have one more week in it, his life has just been ministering to us in so many different ways because there's no story like a true story. I mean, there's there's just no story like studying somebody who's been through some stuff that we've been through or are going through and have seen them come out the other side. God, I pray that this sermon and this series has given us hope in our situation. I pray that it shaped us. I pray that it spoke to us. I pray that it's making us an unqualified solution. God, I just pray today that we will embrace our limitations, that we will embrace the things that we're not, because all everything that we're not is shaping us into everything that we are. And God, as you do that in our lives, may you get all of the glory and all of the praise. And I pray that our whole demeanor changes. I pray that our, our, our situation changes. And I pray that people will look at us and see you. We ask these things, Father, in Jesus' holy name. Amen.